I'm in Numbers chapter 21. I want to share just a few verses with you and kind of set the stage for what we're going to read here. The children of Israel had been four or five hundred years in Egypt as slaves, and they didn't like it. I don't know why. It should have been a fun experience. They did not appreciate being slaves in Egypt. It didn't start out as slavery. It started out as we're going to save you, we're going to help you, we're going to treat you as, as special down here in Egypt. And that's the way it started out. Uh, we learn a lesson about life very quickly when we go through this story. Everything starts out new and fresh and hopeful and whatever and winds up in the mud. That's the story of life down here. And that was the story of their experience. And so they left Egypt on a trek we call the Exodus. We've talked about it. You know what it is. Where were they going? Come on. Where were they going? To the... They were going to heaven. They were going to the promised land. That's what they planned. That's what they were told. That's what they were counting on. And they hadn't gotten very far out into the desert and... Uh, they ran out of fresh vegetables. You remember what they said? At least we had garlic and onions back there in Egypt. All we got out here is cactus. Uh-oh. When we get to chapter 21 of Numbers, we'll find out that they had something besides cactus. They had uh, serpents. Fiery serpents. So I want to pick this up. Uh, verse 4, chapter 21. They journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. You ever been discouraged? Well, you get a whole crowd of folks discouraged. They were discouraged because of the way. Now the people spoke against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, no water, and our soul loatheth or hates or despises this light bread. What light bread are they talking about? Manna? Come on, that's it. It's called Did they already manna. Have the manna. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We hate this manna. Did I tell you about my first experience with uh, the sanctuary and the things in the sanctuary and the things in the Ark of the Covenant and how the teacher from Wildwood on this Sabbath morning said, all right, we're going to take the lid off of the box and who wants to look inside? Boy, I was Johnny right away. I wanted to see what was inside that box. Good morning. And uh, I saw a walking stick with a few plastic flowers taped to it. I saw two tables of the Ten Commandments. And what else did I see? I saw a bowl. And what do you suppose the guy had put in the bowl to represent manna? Cornflakes. <laughs> now you're, you're talking to a kid, a teenager, and I... You know, I was not familiar with all of these stories, at least not well enough to know what was going on. And I said, that looks like cornflakes. <laughs> and he said, young man, that's manna. <laughs> you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness. This is verse 5. There's no bread, there's no water, and we hate this light bread. Okay? Our soul loatheth this light bread. And so the Lord responded to their happiness and sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And a lot of people died, it says. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He takes away the serpents from us. 
And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looks on it, he'll live. Folks are dying from snake bite. Here's how you can avoid dying. Look on it. Look upon it. And Moses made a serpent of brass. This is verse 9. Put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, it saved him. He lived. So I have some questions. I've, I've read several chapters before this, and I've read several chapters after this, and they're rather explicit that don't make an image of anything. Okay? Don't do it. And if you do, and you see somebody looking or bowing or making an image, stone him to death. So here we are with what apparently is against the law. But if you do this, if you look at this brass serpent up on a pole in the air, if you just look at it, the snake bite will go away and you'll live. So let me ask you something. If, uh, if you're down here today and you're just taking care of mowing the lawn or around the lake or whatever and a snake bites you, What's the secret of survival? Come on. The secret to survival is to hurry up, make a brass serpent or whatever out of tin or aluminum or whatever and put it up on a pole and look at it and you don't have to go to the hospital. Now, what do you suppose this experience is in the Bible for, and what is it meant to teach you and me? We're talking about you and me, or we're talking about the children of Israel back there. And where were we going? Where are we all wanting to go? We're going to want to go to heaven. And uh, when do we want to get to heaven? Now. Now. Right. <laughs> and the real question... The top dollar question over here is, how come we never get there? What's going on that we never get there? 4,000 years, not enough. 5,000 years, not enough. 6,000 years, so far not enough. What is going on? Everyone wants to be saved but the issue, when you really get out and start talking to the guy down the road like I was, everybody has their own idea of how to be saved. Evidently, on this occasion, how to be saved was to make an image of a snake, put it on a pole, put it up in the air so everybody in the camp can see it. And if you just look at it, if you just look and see this brass serpent on the pole, you're saved. Now, were they saved from snake bite? Were they saved from sin? Were they saved from the serpent that started us whole garbage root in the garden? What what is what is this what is this experience all about? Well, the first thing we know is they didn't like manna. They didn't like the road they were traveling. They didn't appreciate the wilderness. Oh, the wilderness is so wonderful. You know how what they were told before they got out of Egypt? We're leaving Egypt and the land of Goshen, because the land of Goshen was the most fertile part of Egypt. We're leaving the land of Goshen. And we're going where? Where? 
to a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. And all we got is snakes and scorpions and cactus and heat and cornflakes. Does this sound like life to you? What we want to do is examine how people read the Bible and what they turn it into. Um, I was visiting with a friend up in Huntsville, Alabama one day. His wife was one of my canvassers, call porters. She was out on the job and I had just stopped by their home. Hus hubby was home because he had had the flu and all of this kind of thing. And so we visited a few minutes. He was a jolly kind of fellow. He was always happy even if you have the flu. So um, he started telling me about an experience he had a day or two before. He said, uh, yeah, I was here and I heard knocking on the door. Went to the door and there was three people at the door, two men and a woman. And they wanted to come in and visit with me. I said, fine, come on in. So in the course of the conversation, um, they got down to business. And the business was, we belong to the true church. Now you would think at first these were Jehovah's Witnesses. No, these were Church of Christ people. They got down to business, and they were talking about how you know the true church. And they explained that in their church, they didn't have musical instruments. We don't use piano and organ and musical instruments. It's against the Bible. By the way, if you ever meet any of this, ask them why they have air conditioning. It's not mentioned in the Bible either, you know, I mean. I mean, is this silliness or is this silliness? It was not silliness to these people. This was cardinal doctrine. This was how you get to heaven. And if you've got pianos and organs in your church, you ain't going to make it. They're saved by works. If you ask them, do you believe in salvation through works? Absolutely not. Anyhow, my friend was talking to them and they made the point that uh, if you have musical instruments in your church. Do you have musical instruments in your church? Yes, we do. Well, you do not belong to the true church. He said, let me ask you something. In the great day of the Lord, what are you folks going to do when Gabriel blows the trumpet? <laughs> do, do you understand? Do you understand? You go all the way around this globe and there are umpteen religions and there are 600 different versions of Christianity. 600 plus. And what makes one minus and one plus is what they believe about what you have to do in order to be saved. The whole thing is we have the truth. And if you don't have this truth and if you don't keep and obey this truth, you're not going to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? You better get rid of pianos and organs. I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. You begin to understand why there are millions of people, even in this country, which we refer to as a Christian, you know, largely Christian. There are millions of people in this country who want nothing to do with the nonsense called religion. Nothing. I don't want to hear it. I'm sick and tired of all the yeah, 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 back and forth. So let's paint a picture. Let's pretend that you and I are uh, 
Adam and Eve. How's that? Adam and Eve. We're back here. Where do we live? In heaven. How can you say that? There was a snake in the garden. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. And did someone, was someone bitten by this fiery serpent? Oh yeah. The thing is, it felt good. Now, that's double trouble. If a serpent bites you, that's not supposed to feel good. That's not a good thing. But you know it is a serpent and a fiery serpent and a wicked serpent when it can bite you and you think you're in heaven. Now, if the Baptists had been back there in the garden, they would have immediately pulled out some verses and said to Eve and then to Adam, Are you saved? I accepted Christ as a youth in the Baptist faith, and I loved it. I was one of the first members in this little community church, and we raised up the basement, barely got a, some boards and a tin roof stretched across it. And next thing you know, in a year or two, we were ready to put the second floor sanctuary on and whatever. I loved it. But I was eight or nine years old, and there were some saints in this church. And if you're a saint, you have a duty. And your duty is to make sure that everybody has been saved. There's nothing wrong with that. And so um, on a certain Sunday morning, I was sitting in the pew, just like any other Sunday morning. And a brother in the church, one of the older men in the church, came up and put his hand on my shoulder and he said, uh, Brother Charles, have you been saved? And my childish response was, I guess so. <laughs> you haven't given your heart to Jesus? Well... What does coming to church mean? I mean, when the pastor makes an appeal, you need to go down front. And you need to be baptized. Have you ever been baptized, Brother Charles? No. I thought when you were baptized, you were washing away sin. I don't know what I got to wash away, but okay. So when the pastor made an appeal, I went forward. And uh, we didn't have a bab baptistry yet in our new, fledgling new church. So we made an arrangement, the pastor made an arrangement with the Baptist church over in Lipscomb. And we worked it out. And one other young fellow and I were baptized. Uh, am I sorry? Never. Never. I value the experience. But the day came, I got mixed up with Adventists. <laughs> mixed up is the right expression. Okay? And they wanted me to take Bible studies. I said, well, I've already read the book. I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the doctrines and what the church teaches and believes. I've, 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 already, I've already read all of that, and I, I agree with it. You need to be baptized again, Brother, Brother Charles. What did I do that I need to be baptized again? Oh, you've been touching Baptists. Are you listening to the guy up the road here? If you don't belong to my church, you're not going to make it. And what these worthy Adventists were saying to me as a youth was, if you don't, you, your baptism didn't really count because ours is the true church. How do people get to heaven? 
I was in a seminar somewhere once upon a time here a few years ago, and I said, uh, I know you probably won't agree with me, but all those folk that died in the wilderness for 40 years left town thinking they were going to heaven and wound up dead in the desert. Now, you may think otherwise, but I don't believe they're necessarily lost. <laughs> Why do you think they died? Because it got old. They got worn out. They got tired of going around in circles in the desert. They got tired of cornflakes. They got tired of. Okay? Do you mean to tell me that people who left Egypt, who left town on a promise that for some reason wasn't going to happen at that time, you mean to tell me that they're lost? Well, absolutely. Because Jesus had not come yet. Oh. I hadn't thought about that. They didn't call on the name of Jesus. They weren't baptized. And so the more you make your way from place to place and people to people, the more you begin to see that people are really concerned about how do you get to heaven. And you better not offend God on the way. So don't call it cornflakes. It's manna. What did they say? But we loathe this white bread. They were just telling the truth. We had garlic and onions back there in Egypt. And now all we have is white bread. How, how, do you, how do you and I sort these things out? I mean, we're talking about real life, real people. We're talking about real experiences, and we're talking about several thousand years of it. And here we are. We're still here. And if we stay here much longer, I'm going to get old, wear out. They're going to bury me. And you. So let's see if I have this right. I was born. I didn't know anything. So my parents began teaching me some things. Hopefully along the way of being taught, someone says, you really need to know about God, and you really need to know about Bible stories, and you really need to know about, and you need to know these things, and they'll change your life. So somewhere along the way after I was born, I began to learn certain things. Now, what about all the folk on the other side of this rock we live on? I mean, uh, by the time I was born in 1942, several billion had come and gone. But according to many Christians, they don't count. They don't, they don't have a chance. They have not professed the name of Jesus. They have never read and followed and obeyed the Bible. They've never been baptized. They're lost. And my little brain somehow doesn't register all of this conveniently. When I was born, what did I know? Zero. Well, I'm so thankful that everything that I have learned along the way is 100% correct. 100% pure. 100% I'm on my way to heaven. So I, I, I'm going to pose the question, and don't let it trouble you, but let it trouble you. What must I do to be saved? That's what the young lawyer asked Jesus. Sir, I want to be saved. What do I need to do to get saved, to be saved? Well, how can we do this so it makes some sense? 
Was there a lamb in the garden? That's where, you know, the trouble started. Was there a lamb in the garden? Um, tell me what the lamb in the garden looked like. He was killed. He was slaughtered. And the, his clothes were taken off of him and put on them. Well, what was that all about? Well, they were naked. Yeah, but it wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. What was that all about? Well, before he put them out of the garden, he gave them a promise. What did he promise? I will put... I'm, I'm, it was the Messianic promise, Genesis 3.15. That was the promise. Um, was the promise understood enough, clearly enough, made plainly enough that they understood it's going to be at least 4,000 years before you can see him. Was the promise made in such a way that they could misunderstand it? Oh, absolutely. And did they misunderstand it? Yes, absolutely. And how do we know they misunderstood it? Because they thought that their firstborn son, Cain, was the promised Messiah. And that's why Eve, it's recorded in the book, I have gotten a man from the... No, no, no. She got a man from the devil. <laughs> Welcome to life on planet Earth. How do you and I... How do millions and millions of people who have come onto this rock and lived miserable existences and dead and gone and never heard the gospel... How do, you, how, how do you account for this and the goodness of the Lord and grace and mercy and generosity and all the rest? How do you account for this? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to put something out here for you. Is it possible that when John 3.16, spoken by Jesus, was given, for God so loved... Uh, Fill in the blanks. Primitive Baptists. Jehovah's Witnesses. Mormons. Well, let's get past, you know, how about Muslims? How about Jews? How about Buddhists? How about Hindus? How about, how about, are any of these people, do they have any chance at all at salvation and eternal life? Because they do not measure up to what most people believe you have to measure up to in order to get to heaven. So God has a plan. God has a plan. We call it the plan of salvation. And evidently, it includes a lamb, and it includes a priest, and a high priest, and it... so. We, we want to understand how folks for 4,000 years have a chance at being saved in the kingdom of heaven, eternal life. We want to understand how millions, no, billions of people who lived for the first 4,000 years can get to heaven because Jesus hadn't come yet. They didn't call on his name. They weren't baptized. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they didn't, they didn't. Do they have a chance at heaven? I don't like that word chance. If we're going to take chances, none of us are going to make it because we were all born rotten. Ooh, don't say such things. Yeah, yeah, I am going to say such things because that's what the Bible says. We're all born into sin. Thanks to mom and dad and the serpent. Okay? So the question is, how is God going to get some of these people I mean, he may not get all the billions, but he's, he's going to get some of these people, I hope, a lot of these people, I hope most of these people, into heaven. So here we have Jesus before his crucifixion. And he says, for God so loved uh, my church, my country, my family. For God so loved who? That he gave... Now we begin to read Paul, the apostles and Paul in the New Testament. 
and uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in your house. We've gotten past cactus. We've gotten past serpents on brass poles. We've gotten past, we've gotten past, all, and now salvation is simple enough that if you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the brass serpent up on the pole, by the way. Why would God picture Jesus, Messiah, as a serpent? Have you ever read the New Testament? God made him to be what? Sin. How did he do that? Because when Jesus took humanity and came here to this world, he came here without sin, unlike you and me. Well, he had to inherit it from his parents. No. His mother was earthly, but his father was unearthly. And it was the seed of the father. It's always the seed of the father that determines. Always. So Jesus came here for the express purpose of what? Come on. Taking our sins upon himself, which means Please don't sin while you're here. Please don't make a mistake. Please don't fall off the road. Because if you do, we're all lost and there's no hope for salvation for anybody. So please don't sin while you're here. And what is the record of Scripture? Without sin. Without sin. A lamb without blemish. And God puts our sins on Him. Now how does He do that? Boy, here it comes. Don't miss it, okay? Tell me when Jesus died. Come on, tell me when Jesus died. Now don't start counting thousands of years and whatever and whatever. When did Jesus die? He is the lamb slain from the before Adam and Eve got into the garden. The father had pledged his son if it ever became necessary. And the son had pledged himself if it ever became necessary. So he was the lamb slain from when? Oh no, he was slain 4,000, 2,000 years ago. No, 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 no. God is always present, tense, always. So when was Jesus slain? The moment, the instant he promised to die if we got into sin. Okay, now we have to account for 4,000 years. How do we account for 4,000 years? See, we're dealing, we're dealing with divine beings and we're dealing with human beings. We don't operate on exactly the same clock. I was about nine or 10 years old and uh, my dad had some buddies at work and the Birmingham Barons were going to be playing the Memphis whatever in Birmingham. And um, my dad and his buddies liked to go every time they could. My dad surprised me on this occasion and he said, you want to go to the game with us? Oh man, I want to go to the game. I had never been to a real live baseball game. I want to go. Now, when you're young and inexperienced, anything out of the ordinary grabs you. And where we were sitting in the stadium that day, something happened and it grabbed me. I watched the pitcher wind up and let go of the ball. I see it 
as it's happening. He threw the ball, and I saw the batter draw back, and poof, and he hit a home run. And I thought, man, this is really neat. And while I'm thinking about this is really neat, suddenly I heard the crack of the bat. What? Now he hit the ball seconds or milliseconds ago, but I'm just now hearing the ball hit the bat or the bat hit the ball. Why is that? Why is that? Because light travels how fast? But sound is different than light, and it has to flow through a totally different medium, and that different medium is called earth and all the stuff associated with it. God was doing things for you and me before we were ever even born. Before we ever came along and said, I don't know what I'm doing here, but it stinks. <laughs> right? Well, you and I are not the only people on the planet who have thought it, said it, You and I are having to live within the confines of this creation that we're part of. So God does something way back there, but it hasn't gotten to us yet. This is, this is the parable of the wheat and the tares all over again. Didn't you sow good seed? Yes. Well, where did these weeds come from? We're going to pull them up. No, you're not. See, that's the crack of the bat syndrome. Now, you and I live down here in the real world. And if I let the tares go and don't pull them up, I'm not going to get anything to eat at all. But Jesus is talking about something otherworldly. The disciples thought he was talking about growing a garden. So God is working out His purposes, but it's taking, in human terms, it's taking a long time. And uh, occasionally in the morning I wake up and say, Lord, I don't like it. Now, you're not supposed to murmur, and you're not supposed to complain. Yeah, and you're not supposed to live down here. We were never meant to live down here. I'm a sinner, but I was a sinner before I ever knew what sin was. How did that happen? How did that come about? Because it's called genetics. The book of Genesis explains all of this. Talks about cattle and what you can do to have, you know. Genetics. I'm a sinner by the gene pool or through the gene pool. So are you. So is everyone who's... The, the scripture is clear enough on this point. For we have all sinned and come short. All of us. Well, I don't want to live like this forever. Well... There's good news because God has promised it's not going to be this way forever. How do we deal with all of this time lapse? How do you, how, because the Jews came along down here in the Exodus. And that's where God gives the first serious talk and lesson about how to get your sins blotted out or taken care of or removed or forgiven. Okay? And this is how it works. The sanctuary is a holy place. What does that mean? What, does, what makes this tree holy out in the desert that's on fire and won't burn? Take your shoes, your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground. What made that ground holy? The presence of God. And when the fire went away and God went away, it was no longer holy ground. 
But there are millions of people who go to, this is where Jesus stepped. This is where the apostles walked. This is a nail from the cross. We've got to touch the real stuff. I'll tell you what the real stuff is. It's wandering 40 years and never getting anywhere. That's the real stuff. Okay? And we need some answers to these issues, these questions. So, how is a person saved? I'll tell you how they're saved. You have to come to the sanctuary. Well, uh, where is the sanctuary? Well, it's out in the desert. Well, how many sanctuaries are there? One. Well, I live in North America. How am I going to get to the desert of Sinai and take a lamb in and, and get forgiveness? How is all that going to work? Somebody please tell me, how is this going to work? And by the way, you need a perfect understanding of perfect truth. And then we can talk about heaven. So what is this plan that we call the plan of salvation, or God refers to as the plan of salvation? How many people have ever taken a lamb to the sanctuary and offered it up for their sins? We're, we're talking about heaven's prescription, heaven's plan. How do you get your sins off of your back onto Messiah? Well, you've got to bring a lamb. And when you get there, You've got to take a sharp knife and cut his throat. You have to cut his throat. Not the priest. You have to cut his throat. This sounds like the kind of church I want to belong to. Are you listening? You have to bring a lamb. Okay? We've learned spiritual lessons and spiritual truth here. And we find out that Jesus came to be our lamb. Uh, Lord, you're too good. You're too righteous for this. And uh, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, get out of my way. You're in the way, Peter. I came here to do something. What did I come here to do? To die. Did Jesus want to die? No, no. All you got to do is get up on top of the mountain and listen to him pray all night long. No, Jesus, it's not, it's not in any of us human beings to want to die. But the death that he was looking at was the death that all men must die. And he didn't die the first death only. He died the second death as well. And that's what he feared. He feared separation from his father. And when he got to the cross, listen to the prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I have lived forever in your presence. Way back there, I have lived in your presence. And you have never turned your back on me. And I have never turned my back on you. Where are you? So, when God turned his back on Jesus, who was he turning his back on? You and me? No. On his own son. His own flesh and blood. My only begotten son. That's who he turned his back on because he put our sins on him. He became sinful. Are you listening? So we bring a lamb and our lamb dies. Now we find out that there's more to the story. He has to go to heaven to see his father and his father has to approve of what he did, what he passed through down here. Father, will you accept my sacrifice? Yes, son, I will accept your sacrifice. But, sit down here. Well, how long, Father? I mean, I, 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 how long? sit down. 
Here we go again. Did God tell his own son how long it's going to be? No. Listen to Jesus, Acts chapter 1. I don't know. The angels don't know. No man knows, but the Father only. Why would God stretch this thing? He's not stretching it out. It is our creation that stretches it out. It's called the crack of the bat. Now I want to share something with you. This is beautiful. This came to my mind. And I remembered way back there in my first few weeks in college. And uh, I, I, I remembered, hey, that's chapter 3 in Desire of Ages. And I even remember the title of the chapter. The Fullness of the Time. So just listen to a few lines. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. Now I would think that the great day of the Lord would be the fullness of time. I mean, when the fullness of the, the time specific was come, God sent forth His Son to redeem them that were under the law. Uh-oh, uh-oh, here we go. We've got whole denominations who say, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. To redeem them that were under the law. Poor Adventists trying to keep the law. Miserable Adventists trying to get to heaven by keeping the law. What does this expression, to redeem them that were under the law? It's the penalty of the law. And what was the penalty of the law in the garden? If you do this, you're going to what? You're going to die. Jesus came to redeem us from the penalty of the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Century after century passed. The voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel. Many were ready to exclaim, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. You can check it out in Peter. Peter says that's what the last generation is going to say. It's, it's been this way since forever. Is that true? Yeah, in human terms, it's absolutely true. As the Jews had departed from God, uh-oh, evidently they got together in a camp meeting and they said, let's depart from God. Let's take a vote and let's depart from God. Why would the Jews depart from God? Because we were promised milk and honey and we haven't seen a drop. So on that Sunday morning in that little Baptist church and I took my stand for Jesus, if I had been run over leaving church and died, I was saved. But I grew up, and that's an uh-oh. <laughs> so if God would just cut it off, think of all the people who'd be saved. Think of all the good that that would accomplish, and all the bad that that would erase. As the Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim. Hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the future. The words of the prophets were uncomprehended. Com comprehended. To the masses of the people, death was a dread mystery. Beyond was uncertainty and gloom. It was not alone the wailing of the mothers of Bethlehem, but the cry from the great heart of humanity that was born to the prophet across the centuries. The voice heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. They're gone. In the region and shadow of death, men sat. With longing eyes, they looked for the coming of the Deliverer when the darkness should be dispelled and mystery, the mystery of the future be made plain. 
is are we promised there's a time coming when all the mystery of the uncertainty and the misinformation and we are promised by God I'm going to answer all your questions but it's going to take a few more cracks of the bat and God knows how long it's going to take I don't you don't but we try to speed things up we try to help God out on the clock I, I want to say this without being misunderstood we have Jesus saying to his disciples, Now I'm going to heaven, and while I'm gone, I want you to go, and I want you to teach men all the things that I have shown you, told you, and commanded you. Now that means all kinds of different things to different people, but what God is saying through the lips of Jesus, what God is saying is, don't just sit down here till you die. Do something good with the time you have allotted. Do something worthwhile. Go out and sell Bible story books. Do something good because there's a whole bunch of bad down here. So you and I were not to just sit down here and let the time pass and say, well, another thousand years are gone. I wonder how many more thousand are going to... You cannot read this in human terms, in human time. You have to understand what God is saying to you. I promise you, I promise you that it's not always going to be this way. There's a day coming. I pro Listen, I'm promising you new heavens and a new earth wherein the former things are what? Passed away. Not to be remembered or brought to mind. Oh, yes, but who's going to make it? I know who's going to make it. Those who belong to my church. They're going to make it. Do you understand how human beings grasp at straws? And that's all they are. They're just straws. Just a little more right here. Outside of the Jewish nation, there were men who foretold the appearance of a divine instructor. We're talking about the wise men. We call them the, the wise men who came from the East. These men were seekers for truth. To them, the spirit of inspiration was imparted one after another like stars in the darkened heavens. Such teachers had arisen. Their words of prophecy had kindled hope in the hearts of thousands in the Gentile world. That's you and me. I, I, I can't prove to anybody that I'm a Jew. And I've got a lot of friends who are trying to prove that they're Jews. No, the object lesson of the New Testament is to teach you and me and everybody out there that you can still get to heaven even if you're not a Jew. But the reason that was not taught before Jesus died and was resurrected is because it wasn't true before. It's true now because He died. He paid the price. Something is yet to be accomplished in all of this and we're going to close. Okay, it took 4,000 years, the crack of the bat. It's taken another 2,000 years, the crack of the bat. What are we waiting for right now? What are we waiting for? What is God waiting to do? Why doesn't He just do it? Let's speed this thing up. No. It, yes, it's the fullness of time, but that's not the answer. God knows when the rocks and all this stuff going to fall out of the sky and what doesn't hit you from up there, you're going to men are going to bomb you down here. So, welcome to earth. What is it that we are waiting for? Because no one can get into heaven. No one can get into heaven with sin on him, with sin in him. Can't, it, can't, it just won't work. 
You know, the city of God, oh, heaven, the city of God, made with God's own hands. Why does it have gates to keep people out? Well, why would you want to keep people out? Because there's some bad folks out there. We call them devils. Sometimes we call them neighbors. <laughs> what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the last work in the sanctuary. Lamb, a high priest. But what is the last work? The blotting out of what? No, no, no. Your sin. My sin. It's specific. It's not nebulous. Okay? Now the book of Hebrews spells this out in wonderful ways. All those sacrifices they made through the years, this is what Hebrews says, they brought all of these lambs and they brought all of these calves and they brought all of this and there were rivers of blood and the rivers of blood did not serve to clear the conscience. See, that's, that's if, if, if I'm the same me on the inside, that ain't heaven. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want me to go to heaven. Does that make sense? So God has a plan. He knows that you and I cannot save ourselves. If I keep every law in the Bible and every law in Russia and every law everywhere, if that, that's, not, that's not what's required. What's required is pristine, sinless, without sin. No dirty thoughts, no dirty words, no meanness. That's what it means. That's what it means to blot out your sins. So Peter, way back there in the book of Acts, chapters 1, 2, and 3, thought that that was the great day of judgment and the great day of the Lord. And he said, uh, you better repent, every one of you. What he had just done is tell them, you're the ones that killed Messiah. You, you, you. And you better repent that your sins may be what? Blotted out when the times of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit come. That's the times of refreshing. So I'm going to pose this question. Is it possible that God knows your circumstance and mine and every human being from the garden to the last? Is it possible that God knows that you and I were born lost and that we cannot save ourselves in any way, shape, or form? Is it possible that God knows all of this and has a plan to get us through the gates into the city without spot or wrinkle or any such thing? That, my friend, is called the plan of salvation. I believe that's where we're going. Now, I don't believe every human being is going to be saved. But it's not up to me to decide who gets in. I mean, I've already told the Lord, if you let Hitler in, I ain't coming. And that guy over yonder, if you let him in, mm. Listen, we're talking real life, folks. We're talking about real Bible. We're talking about real things. Is it possible that God is so good, so generous, so forgiving, so long-suffering, that He sees every one of us and knows that if He is left to, or if you and I are left to working it out ourselves in any way, shape, or form, hang it up. Well, I don't think he should forgive that much evil. Well, tell me how much evil you think he should forgive. You know, this was all played out in the New Testament. Jesus said, uh, let me ask you something. 
This guy sinned one sin, and this one sinned seven sins. Now when the Lord comes, which one of these two is going to be thankful, more thankful, very thankful, the one who sinned once or the one who sinned seven times? And the guy had it right. I suppose he that sinned the most. You're right, Jesus said. You got it. Now, the next question is, who's the guy that sinned seven times? Don't look in the mirror. You understand? Is it possible that God is good enough, merciful enough, long-suffering enough to let you in? But he cannot just say, throw the doors open and let them in. No. They cannot come in with one trace of sin on them. Not a speck. So how does God propose to clean us up before He brings us home? It's in Revelation. You can read it for yourself. It is time for thee to work, O Lord. The, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation is, it's time for you to take authority, O Lord. And he's going to blot out sins. How, how is that expressed in the book of Revelation? This blotting out of sins. He that is righteous, let him be righteous how long? Forever. He that is filthy, let him be filthy how long? So there is a day. There is a choosing. There is a separation. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow together until... And in that day, I will say to my angels, you go get the wheat, throw the tares into fire. You go get the sheep and get rid of them goats. Okay? The Bible is not an easy book to read. It's not an easy book to understand. But if we look around and we see people that we don't think measure up, we need to carry a pocket mirror. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness to come and your willingness to send him. We thank you that he lived a righteous life and that it is being offered to us because we're not righteous, never have been and never will be until you make us new on the inside and the outside. That's the promise of your plan. That's what everyone on this rock and everyone up there is waiting for. For the final work in the sanctuary for the final work when Jesus and Jesus alone can make the pronouncement. The Father judges no man, Jesus said, but judgment is given to the Son. Oh, Lord Jesus, save us lest we perish. We thank you for an opportunity to come together today and for every day you give us. We thank you in Jesus' name and for his sake and our own. Amen. Amen.